I have to say, I don't recognise myself there at all. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thanks, Keen. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to push this up a little bit there so I make sure I'm, I can be heard. And we'll just test the pointer, which is not great on a screen like that. Anyway, it um, doesn't matter. So what I have, I have about half an hour to talk to you uh, about housing. And what I do with this presentation is I look at data. And normally what I do, I do this, I've done this presentation for a few different organisations, but I, I tweaked it slightly for today. But even people like the National Disability Authority, uh, some of the unions, the central bank, and what happens is when I give the overarching data, which is what this is all about, you can kind of join the dots uh, to, to match your own agenda or your own lobbying requirements or whatever at the bottom end. So I was surprised one day the National Disability Authority wanted to see me. But actually, they, they got lots of stuff out of this as well. And I, I couldn't join the dots at all. But anyway, they joined the dots. And the same with some of the unions and the same. I can't remember whoever I gave this to uh, before. But I, I've done this. I've kind of changed it. Um, a fair bit of what I was doing last night, actually. Uh, changing it um, uh, to kind of you know, suit the audience. Um, so the first thing we're going to look at is we're going to look at different types of housing output. What are we building and who are we building it for? Or who is it being built for? And what are the implications of that? So the first one I lo want to look at is social housing output. Don't mind all the data, right? This is uh, Mel Reynolds. Spends, uh, Mel is an architect and kind of policy guru. And he spends a lot of time, the Department of Housing released a 200-page PDF with loads of lines on it, uh, and it, Mel has to go through it with a ruler and a pencil, basically, to make this work. And they refuse to release the Excel spreadsheet, which is a disgrace, despite the Karen Corley telling them to do it several times. Uh, and so we go through this, and Mel has never really been wrong. Uh, I think he was out by one house one year, out of thousands. Uh, so I think, you know, we're okay. And that's the interesting thing about this is when you see... Uh, what has been built and who has been built. Unfortunately, Fingal, so this is the local authority and AHB output, Fingal directly built zero houses, social houses last year, and nor did they buy any in the turnkeys. Uh, and, you know, obviously that's the Minister of Housing's own constituency there. And unfortunately, Cork, where the T-shirt comes from, also managed to build uh, zero houses, Cork City, zero houses, and bought uh, zero houses as well in terms of turnkeys. And that's pretty shocking, to be honest with you. Um, now, nobody did really well. Fingal, it gets really interesting when you match it to the housing waiting list. Fingal, who built, directly built zero and bought zero, the council themselves, the AHB did the heavy lifting for them there. They've got nearly 5,600 households. These are households, not people, on the social housing waiting list. Dublin, the four Dublin local authorities, does this actually work on this thing? No, it doesn't. Anyway, the four Dublin local authorities in the green circle at the bottom, it does, it, you don't have to read the numbers, 175 houses between the four of them. Uh, last year. Uh, and of course, the four Dublin local authorities housing waiting list uh, on the waiting list is nearly 26,000 households. And if there's another, you know, if you add on HAP, we've got a total of about 60,000 people on the social housing waiting list in the country and another 60,000 uh, uh, on HAP. Uh, and we managed a total of, I think, about 4,500 social houses last year. So we're not really at the races. Uh, but it's interesting to see. The, but the one on the right is basically the small counties have issues as well. You think it's just Dublin and Waterford and Galway and Limerick. It's a small county. Clare has got Clare built like 30 something houses last year, whatever. But they have 440 households on the waiting list there. You know, and the same with Cavan and Sligo and Limerick and whatever. So the, the, every county uh, has, has its own issues there. And so in 2021, you know, together local authorities and AHBs satisfied less than 9% of the total uh, housing need. And Dublin was like less than 5% uh, of their total housing need requirement. The heavy lifting has been done by the approved housing bodies. Um, it gets interesting. At this stage, we started doing this when Simon Coveney was minister. Rebuilding Ireland. So we've got a good few years' data at this stage. So that's just looking at the national data or the totals between local authorities and HB's output, and then Dublin at the bottom. And what you see um, there, what we're trying to look at there is the 35, 65, and 40, 60 number. So for pretty much for every house in, in nationally, for every house that councils and AHBs are directly building, they're buying two brand new ones. Uh, and in Dublin, the Dub Dublin local authorities, for every four, they're directly building AHBs and, and approved uh, AHBs and the local authorities. They're buying six. And that's buying brand new houses. Uh, so. uh, and the trends are really that AHB, in particular turnkeys, so that's the purchase of new properties, uh, is up tenfold in the last five or six years. Uh, and uh, on local authority build rates are falling off a cliff, particularly in Dublin, um, which is not what you want. Like you want to see, like Deeper a few years ago had a report out saying that in areas where rents are high, which are Dublin, Goy, Cork, the major urban areas, you should be building, and where rents are low, you should be renting. So in the more rural counties, but we're actually doing the opposite. We're renting in the large urban areas, and we're building houses in some of the smaller places. So we're not even following government government's own advice, if you know what I mean, which we don't. I know I'm doing this for a long time. Housing policy goes in forward and reverse gear at the same time, uh, always, and it just, it'll never meet. 
Um, we, we should also forget that that's the, the gross addition to stock, 4,500 houses, whatever it was last year. Uh, we have to remember we're also selling off housing in terms of tenant purchase as well, and you can argue the pros and cons of tenant purchase all day long. Since 1989, we're selling about 850 houses per annum, but even in the last 10 years, we're selling 375 houses, 373 houses a year uh, to the tenants. What that means, uh, I'm not going to argue the, the rights and wrongs of it, but what it means is that out of the 1,400 direct bill local authority houses last year, you can take pretty much 400 off that uh, because we're, we're selling so many to, to various people. Um, and the state is also heavily involved in the purchase of second-hand houses as well. In 20, some 2017 to 2020, um, from 2017 to 2020, non-household purchases, so that's the state and the institutional funds. Revenue divide this up into household purchases, that's you and me, and non-household, which is companies, basically institutional funds uh, and the state. Uh, nationally, it's gone from 16 to 23% of all second-hand purchases, and in Dublin from 13 to 16%. So they're heavily involved in the second-hand market as well. Councils averaging around 2,200 purchases of second-hand houses every year. And in 2019, about a third of all second-hand purchases, house purchases, in Dublin 12, 7, sorry, Dublin 10, which is out, I think, Drimna and Crumlin that way, and Dublin 17, which I think is Coolock, about a third of them were actually, not about, exactly a third of them were local authority purchases or AHP purchases. So the state is hugely involved in second-hand houses as well, as are the institutional funds. Don't think that the institutional funds are just involved in new apartments, they're also involved in new houses and second-hand houses. The market housing, this is one I really like. So what's coming to the market? Uh, so that basically means, when I say what's coming to the market, people like us, ordinary people out there, what is there for us to buy every year, or your kids, or your cousins, or your whatever it is, right? And this, this is where things get really interesting. Um, so market, that's for those, uh, we'll come to that picture later on, but this is the, really, the one that I like. So you don't, you don't have to worry too much about the table, but ac across the top in the grey line, are how many houses we're building every year. So single houses, they're typically one-off houses. You know, your bungalows are two-story houses, mostly down the country, uh, but not necessarily all of them. Uh, apartments and then what the CSO called scheme houses, which are housing estates, basically, which a lot of us grew up in, including myself. And you can see that the total output has gone from 14,500, 14,300 to nearly 20,500 last year. So total output has gone up by 43%. Yippee, we all think, great. Um, but how much of that actually comes to the market? So how much of it ends up in your estate agent's window available for you to buy as a first-time buyer, a second-time buyer, or whatever, as a new house? So what, to, to get that number, what you have to do, the first red lines across there, so you take away then all the things that will never come to the market. And for example, what typically doesn't come to the market are one-off houses. They're quite often bespoke houses built for specific people. They're not going to sell them. They don't appear in Sherry Fitzgerald's window. Uh, and the other thing that's increasingly uh, not coming to the market, obviously, are apartments. Uh, there's well over 90% of apartments, and particularly in large areas like Dublin, don't come to the market. They're built for funds, by funds. Okay. The other thing, of course, that doesn't come to the market is social housing output. That's for local authorities and AHPs and the state. When you take that away, what you see in the green, you probably can't see the second green line, it doesn't matter, uh, that the amount of housing, despite housing output going up by 43%, the amount of houses coming to the market for us to buy has gone down by nearly 43%. So the output has gone up, and you'll hear the minister and all the, the you know, political parties say, you know, boasting about the housing output being up. It's not about output going up, it's about what kind of out output it is. And this is why the supply, supply, supply mantra that they come out with on the late debate on all these problems that the politicians is effectively nonsense. It has to be the right supply at the right price and the right tenure. And we can see from this that as supply, supply is happening, it's increasing, but our price is coming down, of course they're not. So, because we're building the wrong supply. So the amount of houses that come to the market, the amount of houses that come to the market has gone down from nearly 50% in 2017 to less than 28% last year. So what's driving the change? If it's gone up by 43%, what is 40? I don't know, do you want to ask a question? Is it, can we wait till the end, if you don't mind, because there are loads of stuff to get through? This one, I think it's still below the 35 to 45. Yeah, yeah, no, it's absolutely, it's nowhere near it, and it, it, it won't get there. Uh, price, price, uh, look, the, the, the whole crack about supply bringing down prices doesn't happen, okay? It just doesn't work. And for those of you who did UCD economics, I'm sorry to burst your supply, <laughs> supply <laughs> demand bubble, right? But builders don't build when prices are falling, okay? We'll, 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 we'll come back to it at the end, all right? Um, so the percentage has gone down from about 1 in 2 to less than 28%, okay? So what's driving that change? What you see is driving the change is built to rent output has gone up by between or just under 11% to nearly a quarter of all housing. And social housing output has gone up from the same, from about 10 or 11% to a quarter of all housing.
Okay, so the sale of the development of private housing for sale has gone down. Last year, we built less than well, less than six thousand houses came to the market. Um, so this is all this. So, so la the average is less than seven thousand for the last five years. Six nine nine one. Uh, what's the target for this year in housing for all? Well, rather sneakily. The departments say the target is 11,500 private rental and private sales that conflate the two numbers together. McKillian Woods asked them, the journalist of the Business Post, who does great work on housing, he asked them uh, to break that down and they said it's two thirds, one third, which means their ambition for this year is 7,590 uh, houses, which is a mere 8.5% uh, increase on the average over the last five years. So it's not, they, they don't seem to have much interest in stimulating the, the development of housing for sale, which is, which is a real pity. Now, the stuff that I want to talk about now is the role of land. Land is really critical in determining house prices and, 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 and why that's true. If you look at that site, that's a, I can't even remember where that site is, but I'm just putting it up there to kind of show you. That's a site and it's worth X amount, depending on how many houses I can get on it. It's worth 1 million or 10 million or 20 million or 100 million, whatever it is. But the value of that land and the value of all my other land will, in that area will be dependent on the sales price I can get for the house. So this is stuff we teach in first year property development uh, in there. So the sales price for a house, these are SCSI figures. I don't make up these figures. I, you know, I use quantity surveyor figures. If the sales price of a house, and this, what, bear in mind why all policy is not geared towards bringing down the sales price of a house, it's geared towards helping you afford what's an offer, not, what's, not making what's an offer more affordable. So if the sales price of a house goes up by 10%, look at the value on land, it goes up by 46%. Okay, let's have a look at an apartment. Apartment's even better crack. An apartment, if the sales price of a new apartment goes up by 10%, the value of all my other land in that area goes up by 68%. So you can see that landowners have a large, very powerful lobby in the property development industry, um, you know, quite often with open access to, to the customer, as far as I can see. You can see why they will want anything not to bring down the sales price of new homes that they're building. And if you are a typical landowner, in, or like a large landowner, sorry, a large builder in Ireland, and you're building 500 or 1,000 houses a year, how come your company is worth hundreds of millions? It's not from building 1,000 houses. It's from the land bank that you own. So any minor tweak in the sales price of my new housing will affect all the thousands of other sites that I own. And that's why it's critical for the development industry to maintain sales prices. This is basic stuff that we teach uh, in work, but I, policymakers in the department, I don't think they can get their head around this at all. So that affects, the reason I put the picture up at the start was because all my other sites that I own in that area are directly affected by the sales price I can get for the one in the red line that I own. So it's critical for me not to have to reduce my sales price. And if sales prices do fall, I'm not building anymore until, this, until everything comes, comes back up again. Um, so that's, that's a critically important thing to understand in housing policy, that it's all about, then we go in, we lobby for help to buy, we lobby for subsidies, we lobby for the lending, the central bank lending limits to be lifted. This is all about maintaining my land value. It's not about bringing down the price of housing or making housing more affordable. Um, and so you see, we have end up in a situation why, where the government are giving 120,000 euro to developers, actually up to 144,000 euro to developers, uh, without any requirement to bring down the sales price effectively, uh, because that would affect the value of all the other sites and lands that they own. Uh, and that's, that's it's not, well, it's not healthy, obviously, it's not good. So if you remember anything today, remember that, uh, the impacts on this. Every planning change, and if you go back to that site, Every planning, so that site, if I can get 100 houses on it, it's worth X amount. If I can get 1,000 houses on it or apartments on it, it's worth a whole lot more, right? But that means if it's worth more, the person who buys it off me has to pay more, and whatever comes out the other end, whether it's rents or sales prices, is also going to be directly affected. So the price paid for land has a huge effect on the sales price or rents coming out the other end. So all the planning changes, we can get more units, we can build higher, smaller units, lower standard. That's all about squeezing more units on the same price of land, the same piece of land, and of course the effect on land value is that way. So all the planning changes that have been made have made housing less affordable, not more affordable. Made it more lucrative, but less affordable for us. Most of those planning changes were brought in by the principal planner at the time, uh, who is now the planning regulator whose job now is to mark the homework of local authorities and their development plans to make sure that the, the you know, really poor policies that he introduced are now in their development plans. And that is a huge problem. Uh, so if I was in government tomorrow and Minister for Housing, the first thing I'd be doing is getting rid of those. Uh, because they're make the Department of Housing themselves have a report 
uh, that shows that six storeys is the optimal height for building viability, sales price, getting funding, all that kind of stuff. Because remember, with houses, you can build 10, sell 10, get money, build 10, phase them, it's called. Uh, you can't do that with apartments. You can't build the ground floor, the first floor, and then sell it, and then build the second floor. You have to do the whole lot at once. Building high, like high rises for high rollers, is what I kind of say. Building high is more expensive, and the quality typically, particularly now with the Uber dense stuff we're looking at, is really poor. First time buyers and others, this is just stamp duty stuff. We can see nationally that first non-household completions, so the state and funds have gone up. Purchases of, of housing from stamp duty transactions gone from 17% to 41% in the last five years. At the same time, first time buyer new home purchases have gone down from 54% to 38%. So they're being squeezed out of the market. Um, if you look at Dublin, non-household completions have gone from about 36% to 65%, so basically one-third to two-thirds, and at the same time, first-time buyer new home purchases have gone from 57% to 31 or 32%. So you can see it's totally flipped, and really what's happening here, you don't need to look at that. Nationally, first-time buyers in the last five years are up about 6%. Others, so that's movers, and movers aren't older people with kids flowing the nest. Movers are people who maybe bought an apartment in their 20s, hooked up with someone, need a house, want to have kids, or just need a bigger house. It doesn't matter what you need it for. You're entitled to have whatever size house you want, as far as I'm concerned. Movers are down 20% nationally. In Dublin, first-time buyers are down 36%, 30%, and movers are down nearly 46%. They're not moving because there's nowhere for them to go to. Uh, and you wonder why second-hand prices are going like this because there's nowhere for them, there's no new houses for them to buy, and quite often there's no choice with the second-hand houses either, so there's, people are staying put. Bonkers stuff. So this means, I'm just watching my time here, there's loads of questions around this about the future of home ownership. Our home ownership is our wealth. Every person in this room is worth 175,000 on average. You probably won't find it in your Ulster Bank app, but when you go home to your house, if you're lucky to own one, you'll find it there. That's your wealth. So we're going to make poor people poor, and there's a whole class issue around that. Um, okay. Density, there's an obsession with density, and we end up with this kind of stuff. Um, and this is a Fianna Gael, I don't normally quote Fianna Gael TDs in my presentations, but in fairness, I think he was asking the question rather than anything else. You know, above 35 units per hectare, only apartments can be accommodated. He's questioning this rather than supporting it, I think. So what we have, it's very interesting when you compare Ireland. So I want to question density, because density means more units on a site, uh, and therefore what happens to the land? The land goes this way. Uh, looking at Ireland, there's Eurostat figures about how many apartments we have, how many semi-Ds and terrace houses we have, how many one-off houses. So that's Ireland picked out there. The other country that's really interesting there, just above us, is the Netherlands. One third of the size of the country. Draw a line from Dublin to Galway, everything south is the Netherlands. 17 and a half million people in there. They have more semi-Ds and terrace houses than we do. How do they do it? Because they build like this. What's the advantage of building like that? It's dense, but it's not high so it can be built and sold affordably. Okay, so you don't need to have these high-rise things uh, in order to get density. You just need to build smarter. Okay, and that's, I'd, I'd live in any one of those all day long. I think they're There's loads of parking there as well, just under the house or behind the house or whatever, you know, behind, not under, but behind the house in the kind of car parks at the end of the street. Even in the UK, this, this, this one here is a place called Goldsmith Street in Norwich 2019, won an award from the architect. That's social housing. It's 82 units per hectare, 83 units per hectare, uh, and it's beautiful, and there's loads of car parking there as well, and places for your kids to play and all that. Instead of that, we get this. This is Devney Gardens. Okay. A nightmare, as far as, like, a future slum, right? Because if there's no market for it, the council is going to rent it. That's going to be a disaster. And so that we end up with things like that. Now, I would much rather that or that, that, it's a very tricky, this thing, that or that, than that, anywhere near me. Uh, and the people around at Ebony Gardens feel the same because I spoke at one or two of their events about that. And I feel really sorry for them having to do that. So that's Bartra uh, development there. I'd much rather that any day of the week. And you can add a story onto it. I know the other one's higher density. You can add a story. I don't care if you add two stories onto that. It's still good and better and the same, it'll be the same density. Instead of that, we're getting that. Look at the length of the corridors. You can't really see them, but the corridors are like two, three times the length of this room here. Okay, and they're quite tight, and this is particularly economists lobbying for lower standards to make de development more, in inverted commas, viable. Okay, construction costs and sales, there's no relationship between construction costs and sales price. The sales price is whatever the market will give you, the construction cost tends to remain the same all the time. So that lobbying, particularly by economists, has just ended up with this, because the department weren't able to kind of counter it really. Long corridors, very poor units, very poor quality units. Here's some examples of the poor quality units. This is one that was proposed for Queen's Pub, 37 and a half square metres. Uh, I, the, the red circle that I have there is when you come in your front door, it uh, bangs off your double bed. 
All right, that's what happens. It bangs off your double bet. Okay, and that's not good. Um, and then you go through into a narrow space and into a studio. We call it a studio with a little balcony at the other end. Um, and that's off a corridor. That isn't off an open deck access or off the front, you know, off the street. That's off a corridor. Smells, lighting, ventilation, all that are huge issues in these places, particularly with long, narrow corridors. Second one was what's proposed or what was proposed for Holy Cross College. You see there's one tiny window on the far side. You come in your door pretty much into, into blackness into a kitchen and, there's, and you have to go all through, through the, your 37, your generous 37 and a half square metres, um, which is two disabled car parking spaces, basically. Um, the third one is Goldsmith Street. You know the one I showed you a minute ago in the UK in Norwich? That's Goldsmith Street. The minimum size there is 55 square metres, which is a decent size for a one bed. It's perfectly fine uh, for a one bed. And you come into a, a, a living room, you don't come into a bedroom, there's a window in the living room, there's a window, there's two windows, there's a window in all the rooms, amazing how generous they were. There's a window everywhere. Uh, and you have separate bedroom and dining room and kitchen and bathroom and all that. It can be done. We don't want to do it. We've been persuaded that density means high rides, long, narrow corridors, lower ceilings, no balconies, all the kind of stuff that makes them really unlivable. But we're going to end up with that, and I swear to God, I will, be, I will need to put money on it that councils are going to end up renting some, renting some of these because I don't think there's a market for all of them there. Okay, finally, how am I doing? Eight minutes. Oh, I'm ahead of myself, Grant, <laughs> for once. Okay, the really interesting thing, and I suppose you guys are all politically motivated. I, I'm not a member of any political, political party because I, I talk to them all, and pretty much they all talk to me except Fina Gale for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> Which I, I kind of wear as a badge of honour now these days, despite, despite, my, despite my blue shirt and my, and my parental heritage. Um, yes, well, like the irony is my grandfather and his brother were all Fine Gael councillors. My father was a Fine Gael member when he retired from the Department of Housing. So I we'll have, have strong connections in this. Uh, now, he, was, he wasn't in the planning or housing side. He was a HR guy. But anyway, so the politics is really interesting of housing. And what you learn over the years, and I'm looking at this for a long time, okay, and I read the Dáil debates from the 1950s and all that kind of stuff. Nothing has changed, really. Okay, Not, the way you make money has changed. It's no longer brown envelopes. It's getting policy changed. That's what makes developers really rich nowadays. And of course, it has the added advantage of being totally legal. And if you employ ex-government ministers who have a free pass to walk into Leinster House, much easier than I do, uh, and you know, patrol the part part of the power, um, you'll find policy changes. There's a great paper out there called "De-Democratizing the Irish Planning System." by Waldron and Mick Lennon in UCD. Uh, and it's really interesting to show how easy it was to get the policy change to bring in that SHD development process. And there's a quote in it that says, they took our ideas lock, stock and barrel and put it in the legislation. The principal planning officer at the time was, now the planning regulator. Okay, so politics, where you live, has a huge impact on how you vote, okay? 1966, yeah, family loyalties are quickly being but like where you live, like you might come from rural Cork, we're all hardcore Fianna Fáil or whatever, right? You come to a large urban area, you suddenly realise Fianna Fáil have, don't have as much to offer you uh, in the housing crisis here, or whatever it is, you know. 1966, Ireland was 50% rural, 50% urban, and that's 100 years after the UK, so we didn't have an industrial revolution or anything like that. So we, you see the urban population going up, we're now about two-thirds, one-thirds urban, uh, and one-third, so two-thirds urban and one-third uh, rural. So this is quite an interesting for me, this is interesting in and of itself, okay? When you start to map the share of first preference votes to the main political parties against this, it gets really interesting. Do you want to see Fianna Fáil? Look at that, all right? So Fianna Fáil's share of first preference votes mirrors the decline in rural Ireland. You put a trend line on that, and it's exactly the same. I used to have trend lines, but it got complicated, so I took them off. So Fianna Fáil, and in fairness to me, on Martin, he knows this. I spoke at their party thinking a few years ago, he showed this kind of stuff, and then he brought me back six weeks later to talk at the Ardesh, right, which is, you know, 600 of the party faithful there with, you know, loads of people in the front sharing hand cream when they all came up in the bus from Kerry, whatever, right, and there, the, the likes of me, the likes of me gets hammered to those kind of things, but he wanted me to get that message, this message across to them, which I thought was really interesting. He gets this. Anyway, let's go to Fianna Gael. Not much better in terms of trend line. Okay, so they're in trouble too. They're not in as much trouble as Fianna Fáil, I think. Okay, so you can see the decline in the population of rural Ireland has an impact on electoral results. So you can see this yourself anyway. Uh, I, I don't know what Labour are doing, to be really honest with you, on so many levels. I don't, I don't know what, what they're at. Uh, but, you know, they've, they've been, they, they've a lot of rural heritage and, and also quite, you know, have been traditionally quite strong in urban areas as well. But I think they probably have lost their anchor a little bit in the last little while. But, you know. 
Um, so, so of you know a lot of the others. The only people who have kept their anchor, I think, are Fianna Gael. They've stayed true to their. Actually, if anything, they've moved farther to the right and brought all what would have been left-wing parties into the middle. So now you have old-school Fianna Gael people. And I know there's one particular journalist uh, who rings me and says, "I'm thinking of writing a column to say I should, everyone should vote Sinn Fein," because she doesn't recognise Fianna Gael anymore because they've gone so far to the right. Sinn Fein policies are old-school Fianna Gael and Fianna Fáil policies, basically. And you know, so are yours in in, in many respects, I suspect. Um, but it gets more interesting when we strip out the rural population, let's look at the urban population, uh, and let's look at all the others. Okay, so you can see the, uh, the PDs are in there as well, right, hardly left-wing party. Uh, you guys are in there, you know, there's a whole of Sinn Féin are in there, Paul Murphy's in there, all that. All in there, okay, but you can see where the trend line is going. Okay, so it's kind of mirroring the rise in the urban population. And just to, just to annoy every party, that particularly for the fall, when I do this, I tend to strip out Sinn Féin, uh, and just to put the Shinners in it as well. And you can see what's happening there. You know, and you know that on the ground. You guys know this much better than me. I'm not really politically attenuated at all. Uh, but this is what's happening there. And that's it all together. Um, but you can see, this is something I wrote for the Daily Mail, uh, Fianna Gael in 1989 had 15 seats and now it's eight. Fianna Fáil had 21, now it's seven. The Greens have gone from zero to whatever, six or whatever they have. And Sinn Féin has gone from zero to nine TDs. So you can see the trend of uh, what's happening there uh, in, in terms of, and that's very much about, of, about how where we live affects us on the ground. And some of the smaller parties and yourselves, I'm sure, are no different, are very good on the doors and very good at local. So some of the larger parties aren't. You never see them from one election to the next. And then they wonder why people are not voting for them. Whereas some of the other parties, I, I very much believe in an urban area, you have to be good on the doors between elections. And you have to be responsive on the doors between elections and not just appear when you're looking for a vote. Um, I, I, I very much believe that has a huge uh, impact on that. Yeah, so there we go. Thanks very much. <laughs>